tonight's program is titled Media Literacy. As we get started, I wanted to remind everyone that CSU Global is committed to the foundational principles of academic freedom. As such, any speaker presenting material through Enlightening Talks also has freedom to express his or her own views, which do not necessarily reflect the views of CSU Global. When we're talking about fake, fake news, you know, this phrase has become commonplace in the American vernacular since the 2016 presidential election. Why is that and how did we get here? Um, you know, what is real, what is fake? And how do we as journalists, you know, what do we do to combat um, the cries from folks on both sides of the aisle when a report does not fit their worldview? We, you know, with the recent crisis on the border, we, uh, we, we ran a story two nights ago, I believe, and my inbox was full of emails the next day, fake news, fake news, fake news, but it was coming from both sides of the aisle. So, you know, for me as a journalist, that tells me, hey, we were probably pretty right down the middle, um, you know, on that if we've got both sides crying fake news on how we reported, you know, on the crisis that is, uh, you know, th that is currently going on down there. But to understand how we got there, let's start out with the United States Constitution. So the First Amendment, uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peacefully assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. Okay, that was very important to our founders to make sure that, uh, that this was put in the, you know, in the Constitution. I've got a video here that uh, talks a little bit about the history of freedom of the press. I, I wanted to run through that just so that we would give a history and some, uh, you know, some court cases, things of that nature, so that we understand, you know, how free the press is, how free the press isn't. So early U.S. newspapers um, were partisan by nature. A big part of the reason for this is the uh, Stamp Act of 1765 tax papers and the burden fell to the printers. So the colonists knew the importance of a free press. In the 1770s, most newspapers supported the movement for independence by publishing pamphlets such as, you know, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Then after the War for Independence, most were partisan, directed towards political parties, Federalist or Republican. It might be starting to sound familiar, you know, when we start talking about cable news. Um, and, and, that, and that's what I want you guys to keep in mind as we're talking about this is that you know, a lot of where we are now is where we were. You know, both parties sponsored networks of papers at that time, and the newspapers, because of that, they served a, a, a niche market instead of a very broad market. So they were, they were targeted towards one specific group. In 1835, uh, the New York Herald began to print, and it was, the, it was politically independent, more like a, a, what we understand as a 20th century newspaper, okay? We had reporters, instead of just spewing a party line, they covered beats, they covered breaking spot news, and they were also the first newspaper to regularly cover Congress and have foreign correspondents. At this time, uh, you know, papers, the way they were funded, it was a very different funding source than, you know, how we know that, that papers are funded now or, or really all news organizations are funded, whether it be, you know, television, paper. Before 1900, the papers were funded by sales of the paper, actually, um, instead, of, instead of through advertising. William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, they begin to sell advertising in their newspapers, which is the model that we still operate under today, whether it's online, whether it's broadcast, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's print. But they did this to, uh, to increase profits, you know, whereas before this, the parties encouraged loyalists to buy subscriptions to the papers, and that's how they were funded. When, when Hearst and, and Pulitzer began selling advertising, they were able to appeal as nonpartisan and appeal to a larger base. So instead of being a niche, they now had broad appeal, you know, for folks out there, for consumers who might not even be interested in politics. Um, actually, you know, a reason the folks that weren't interested in politics read it was because of the advertising. So what this led to was, uh, was to yellow journalism, right? Because you had competition. So competition led to, I'm selling these to these advertisers per thousand subscribers. Per thousand subscribers is how I was able to set my rates to sell to advertisers. So that led to competition because, of course, they wanted more subscribers. So what this led to was eye-grabbing headlines, sensational storytelling. Frank Luther Mott had five characteristics of yellow journalism in his book, American Journalism. Um, one, they had scare headlines in huge print, and it was often of minor news. Lavish use of pictures or imaginary drawings. Um, the use of faked interviews, misleading headlines, pseudoscience and a parade of false learning from so-called experts. Put an emphasis on full color Sunday supplements, usually with comic strips, and um, dramatic sympathy with the underdog against, uh, against the system. It, it led to a problem of credibility. In the early 1900s, we had the progressive area that moved in, and so because of the problem in credibility, it led to a strong middle class who demanded reform and which that led to change. 
So what we saw was the yellow journalism went to muckrake. And muckrakers wanted to expose, um, you know, social wrongs, social injustice. And many of them inserted themselves into situations to expose these social wrongs. You know, some of those, they exposed slumlords, sweatshops. Standard Oil was another big, uh, was another big expose. There was another big expose on the meatpacking industry, as well as political corruption. At the start of World War I, attention of the publishers shifted to the war effort, and the investigative journalism kind of fell to the side. However, it regained popularity in the 1960s. A great example of that is Woodward and Bernstein's uh, work on Watergate. We've seen a niche versus broad appeal. We've talked a little bit about it. Right. So we moved from a niche market to a broad appeal market. And then what we're seeing in the modern age, modern journalism in the digital age, is a shift back towards that niche market. A after the uh, first Gulf War, we saw cable news really take off. This talk radio really started to gain some traction in the early 90s as well. And, and, and I think that's where the real niche market came. And then, of course, in the, in the late 90s, you know, that's when the Internet really took off and we had blogs, social media. So what, what we've seen is a, is a return to the niche market based on these, and that's caused what psychologists would term, you know, as group polarization, which is the enhancement of a group's prevailing incl inclinations through discussion within the group, surrounding yourself or surrounding yourself with like-minded people to where you receive reinforcement for what you think. And what this does is it leads a person to shifting to a more extreme position um, when in a group setting of like-minded individuals. How, how do we talk about this? How do we fix this? How, how do we move forward? I, I believe the answer is in media literacy. For so long, journalists, broadcasters, print publishers, um, you know, these niche markets, they really worked because they were selling papers. And now what it's done is we've kind of eaten our own. We have not, we have not educated viewers, consumers, if you will, and, whereas education it is, as in most things, is the key. What is a journalist versus what is a commentator? Understanding of bias and what you consume and watching carefully and thinking critically are, are very important. You know, media literacy is defined as the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create media in a variety of forms. Learn to think critically, become a smart consumer of products and information, recognize the point of view of the author, create media responsibly, that's on us, and identify the role of media in our culture as well as understanding the goal of the author. And I think these are important things, um, in, in my opinion, in the age that we live in now. I think that it is very important and essential that we start teaching media literacy to kids in junior high to high school, as well as, you know, at the college level. So that way they know what they're consuming. That way they can learn to think critically and become a smart consumer of products and information, as well as recognizing points of view of folks. And then for those of us that will be creating that media, we've got to create it responsible. And, and I think all of this is under that umbrella of identifying the role of media in, in our culture. And, and that'll help people to understand the author's goal. This is my contact information for any, uh, any questions that any of you guys might have that you want to send me offline. But I think at this point, we're going to open it up to questions from everyone out there. And I'm going to turn it back over to Eric. Great. Thanks, Ryan. So, Ryan, it looks like the first question is, how did you acquire the expertise to become a news director? Kind of funny. I was... Uh, you know, I started out as a kinesiology major and then switched my major over to history because uh, I was doing pre-law. So I switched my major over to pre-law and, uh, and then my, my father passed away and so um, took a semester off. And when I was going back, I was thinking, man, what do I want to do? What sounds fun? I, you know, what, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? And I had dated a girl who was on the radio at the university that I was going to. And I was like, man, being on the radio sounds fun. And, and so that's, that's how I first got into the communication program at West Texas A&M, where I received my undergraduate from. And, uh, um, and from there, I fell in love with videography. I fell in love with taking pictures. And from there, I fell in love with storytelling, visual storytelling. Um, so I became a, uh, you know, so that's when I graduated. I had a job at, uh, at uh, the ABC affiliate in Austin, Texas, as a photojournalist. Um, didn't take me long to realize that, uh, you know, that, there was a Time Warner station there, a News 8 station, that, uh, um, that they were using MMJs. They called them one-man band at the time. Now we call them MMJs, multimedia journalists. And that was, you know, a, a, a journalist who would go out, or a reporter who would go out, shoot their own, edit their own, write their own, do their own live shot. And I realized that, hey, you know, being a photojournalist is going to go the way of the dinosaur here pretty soon. So I need to develop another skill set. So that's when I became a producer. Um, uh, you know, from there, I did that for, you know, for a while. Um, 
And then that's, uh, that's when I, uh, got into education and started work, went back to my alma mater and started teaching there and, uh, um, and was teaching all the video production classes and all of their news reporting and writing classes. Um, then I received a phone call one day uh, from the general manager at the ABC affiliate there in Amarillo. And he said, Hey, I've been looking for a news director um, for, uh, you know, for eight months and your name, keep your name keeps coming up in conversation. Would you be willing to uh, go have lunch with me? I asked him, said, are you buying? And he said, absolutely. And I said, I've never turned down a free lunch. So uh, then, uh, so that, that's how I kind of became a news director. So I joke around that I'm a storyteller, a photojournalist by trade, kind of a producer by default, and then fell ass backwards into a news director. All right. Uh, so it looks like our next question uh, from Ava. Ava wants to know, why did the readers, or I guess the viewers in this case, um, think that the story that you spoke about earlier um, about the border enforcement and the children was fake news. Well, and, and this is where when I was when I was originally, you know, when, when I first started the presentation and we were talking about, um, you know, kind of where we were is where we are now. Right. Um, uh, you know, with with social media there, there, around the I think it was the 1920s, 1940s, right in there is when the uh, uh, Society of Professional Journalists were formed. And so we all kind of even though we're not regulated, um, because that would be against the First Amendment. Um, so even though we're not regulated by the government, we still have a, a um, you know, as journalists, we have a code of ethics that we operate on. Um, and, but with social media, with the, the long tail, the, the um, and, and for those of you that don't, aren't familiar with the long tail, it's, you know, it's that there used to be a certain amount of choices that were determined for you by the people who were putting those out there. Now with the internet, there's an infinite amount of choices. And so there are so many niche markets, but so with that also comes along what's called, you know, the cult of the amateur that anyone can be out there. They don't have to be professionally trained. They don't have to subscribe to that, you know, society of professional journalists, code of ethics. Um, and so they can be out there putting anything out there. So with what we've seen most recently with the, with, with the issues down on the border in Texas is that, um, is that there's a lot of misinformation out there, but once again, going back to, you know, going back to, um, to people being, you know, to people naturally wanting to gravitate towards people that have like-minded beliefs, um, that's what they grab onto. And so they grab onto that in that misinformation, whether you're on the, you know, whether you're on the left, whether you're on the right, whether you're supporting, you know, the president's decision, whether you're not supporting the president's decision, you grab onto those folks that are, that, that, and their ideas that are, that are closest to yours, because that validates your ideas and your feelings, your perspective, your point of view. And so, um, so I, I think a lot of the, you know, I think a lot of the fake news cries, the emails that I got, you know, the first part of this week um, from both on, folks on both sides of the aisle were folks that, that didn't necessarily know the, the, the truth, I guess, you know, what the, what the real news was. But instead, one, one of the things I tell viewers all the time is just because something doesn't fit in your worldview doesn't mean it's not true. And so, and so I think that that's what it was is I, you know, our reports didn't necessarily fit 100% down the line in the worldview of these people that were emailing into us. And most of them are either far left or far right that take the time and get very outraged by a story. Um, but, uh, but so it didn't fit into their worldview. So that's why in what they had seen on social media, whether it be Facebook, whether it be, um, you know, blogs, whether it be online, wherever they're going, you know, for information, it, 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 it didn't necessarily tote their line, but at the same time, we knew that everything that we were saying was true. I hope that answers the question. Long answer for a short question. Um, so Ryan, the next question that we have um, is what skills are necessary to work um, in news media? There's a lot in the skill set of working in news, right, that, that can be taught. Um, you know, and, and, you know, whether it's how you present yourself on air, or whether it's your writing style, those are all things that can be taught. But the one thing that cannot be taught is curiosity. And it, you have to be a naturally curious person, in my opinion, to work in news. Um, and, and so I think that that's because that's either something that's in you or it's not. And if it's not in you, then then you're kind of going to mail it in every day. You're, you're not there to, you know, one of the things we talk about, you know, you always hear, you know, who, what, when, why. I want to know the how. OK, um, it, the, the how is the most important thing to me. How does this affect people and how did we get here 
how are we going to move forward? Um, you know, one of our, one of, one of the things I, I started this job back in September, um, you know, moved, you know, from Amarillo to Colorado Springs in September. And, um, and one of the things that attracted me as I was looking at different stations, um, as my contract was coming to an end was, um, was, you know, what is the, what's the culture at that station? And the culture here at, at News 5 is, is always watching out for you. Um, and, and so what that is, is, is every one of our stories that we run, um, it, it, it's that, how is this going to affect you and you as a viewer, you personally, all of our stories need to have that watching out for you of how is this going to affect you and what do you need to know to make plans moving forward for the future? And so, and that's that curiosity racket, right? So if we're talking about, you know, what's the most important thing to move, you know, for folks to know if they want to get into this field, it's just a natural curiosity in my what would you say is the most challenging aspect of your job? Uh, the most challenging aspect of my job. Um, my job is, um, you know, I, I'm the I'm the department head for the newsroom. So I have I have 67 curious journalists that work under me. Um, so uh, so that is probably the biggest challenge of my job. Some of them are headstrong, especially when you start talking about your investigative reporters. You know, the 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 modern day muckrakers. Um, you know, the best ones you can find, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're stallions. They are, are not stallions, they're, they're, they're broncos, sorry. Um, you know, they're wild horses. They, they're beautiful to watch, but my goodness, they kick up a lot of dust. And, and so for me personally, in, in my current position, that's the biggest challenge is, is, you know, is managing a group of 67 curious journalists who, um, who I wouldn't have it any other way, but at the same time, they like to kick up a lot of dust. All right. Um, what would you say um, as far as software or applications um, that you use frequently in your job? Um, what were those? You know, I mean, we use produ different producing softwares. We use different editing software. Um, when I first started in, in, in news, we were shooting on tape um, and, you know, and editing tape to tape. And then along came this whole nonlinear editing system, um, you know, editing on a computer. And that really changed things. So, you know, a lot of it has been, um, uh, you know, has been through, you know, but once you use one, it's easy to figure out the others. So, you know, a lot of the software and, and things of that nature, um, it, it, I don't know that that's as important as understanding the, you know, the theory behind, you know, when you shoot video, it's based in, you know, when, when you're talking about framing and you're talking about lighting, that's all based in, you know, in, 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 in classical painting theory, right? You know, classic, you know, theory of art and, um, you know, composition, things of that nature. Um, and, and so, you know, when you talk about writing, you have to have a, you know, it all goes back to those fundamentals. You have to have a strong foundation and then the programs and the software, you're going to pick those up along the way. You're going to figure those things out. You know, when I'm interviewing folks now, if, you know, if, if we've got an open uh, reporter position um, or an open photographer position, I'm less interested in what computer applications, what software they know, and I'm more interested in, in the fact that they've got a very solid foundation. How to verify um, that stories are true um, rather than fake news. Um, wh what does that process look like for you? If we're talking about internally outward, internally in my newsroom, outward to the public, the way that we do it um, is, you know, research, going out there, asking questions, um, and, uh, you know, of, of, you know, of officials or, um, you know, or, or, you know, looking at documents, looking, looking at the raw data is, is how, you know, is where we get it from. Right. And, and that's how we know that, yes, this is, you know, this is a, a, this is, you know, this is founded no different than in the academic world when you're working on a paper. Right. Um, you know, you're going in, you're doing research and, and, and really that's what, you know, as a reporter, you know, and, and the stories that you see filed on the nightly news or that you read in the paper, that's what they've done is they've gone out and written a research paper every day. Some of them are just broadcast, some of them are print. As a consumer, um, I, I, you know, it's that, you know, number one, um, you know, kind of as I said, is that, you know, you, you, you know, you have to educate yourself. We, and, and, and that's something I think we've done a, a horrible disservice to this generation is um, is teaching them to educate themselves on on where that is coming from, on, on where the information they're consuming is coming from, uh, you know, who's giving it to you. When I was in, when I was getting my, my, uh, my master's, um, one of the things, you know, one of the things that I looked at was, um, 
was bias in media. And so, you know, kind of the way you do that is you look to see if you're looking for themes through different articles and, um, and are, are those themes consistent with the way the average member of Congress votes or do they fall to the left or to the right of how the average member of Congress votes? And, and I think that that, you know, that, that's very important now. Um, when you're talking about, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and so you have to educate yourself on, on where different media organizations fall on that spectrum, I guess, of where the average member of Congress votes to know if they lean left or if they lean right. And so, and, and that's just an educational process for yourself um, and, and for the general public out there, because once you can understand what the bias is, then you know how to critically read that article or watch that television station. I mean, it's no, it's no secret out there that Fox News leans to the right of the average, how the average member of Congress votes, and MSNBC leans to the left of how the average member of Congress votes. Now, with the, you know, and, and now I think what you have to do is you have to separate, okay, what is their journalism? What is their news? Because Fox News does produce news, and they produce, and then they, they're short bits that are in between all of their commentary that they have. But their commentary is geared towards that that niche market of the right viewer. MSNBC they produce news. It's once again just a couple of you know thirty seconds, a minute, minute and a half that falls between their their commenters who serve that niche market of folks that have a, a left leaning view. So, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's through education, once, you know, to, as far as being a consumer, it's through education, it's through understanding bias, um, and, 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 and understanding those sources of media that you are consuming. Uh, so the news cycle is caught in a feedback loop when it comes to fake news. So, you know, that, that feedback loop is a public figure declares a story to be fake news. Uh, the news runs with that public figure's claim. Um, and then more attention gets paid to that than the original news story. Um, so how would you say that the news can break that feedback loop um, and regain a position of credible authority? Reputable news sources. And, and if you look at research, what research shows you is that, um, is that folks trust their local news more than they trust the national news. Um, and that's probably, and that's because, you know, the, your local news folks, they're your neighbors. They're the folks that you see in the grocery store. They, they care about your community and what's going on in your community just as much as you do because they're a part of it. Um, so, and, and, I, and I can speak, you know, on the, on the local side of things in that, um, you, know, we, you know, we do subscribe to wire services, but at the same time, we don't take something that, you know, we're an NBC affiliate. And so, and this was, you know, part of what we talked about in our editorial meetings here, you know, within our own newsroom was, you know, was, are we going to take everything that NBC is giving us and are we going to run it in their package or are we going to take it and are we going to break it up into facts that we can absolutely prove? And so, and so that's really what it comes down to. And that's what it's going to come back to. And, and that's how media is going to cre create their own credibility. One is through, is through media literacy. I think that every broadcast organization out there should be pushing Media literacy, like I said, starting as young as, as, you know, junior high, middle school, high school, you know, and, and absolutely at the university level. Looks like we have uh, one final question. Um, so where do you see the future of, of journalism um, and, and, you know, news moving forward? Um, you know, especially in places like Denver, where you hear about the Denver Post um, with the hedge fund that has, um, you know, turned it more into concern about profit rather than the news. Um, you know, people like Jeff Bezos that own the Washington Post, um, you know, the decline in, in newspapers, that, that sort of thing. Um, what do you see um, as the future of, of media going forward? Well, I mean, you know, broadcast, you know, news, newspapers for, heck, man, I don't know, uh, you know, 10 years, probably longer have, you know, really since, you know, the Internet really started to come into its own, in, you know, probably the early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, you know, is when we saw newspapers, you know, we saw their revenues declining um, and, you know, cause you know, circulation numbers were down. Um, and so they, you know, a lot of them moved to online subscriptions and I think you're going to see the same with broadcast, um, uh, you know, and, and so there, there's going to be more opportunity there, you know? So, so when we talk about, um, I mean, right now, what we're seeing as far as, you know, when, when we're talking about the business of news is that, um, you know, we're seeing still great numbers, you know, in, in our local transactions as far as our local sales 
in our regional transactions as far as our regional sales. But what you're seeing is you're seeing a big drop off in national advertisers right now because they're moving from from aver- they're moving their advertising dollars from broadcast to OTT, over the top television, your Roku's, your Apple TV's, things of that nature. Um, and uh, and so I think that that's what we're going to see is we're going to see more. Um, uh, and, and this is, and, and it's really a great opportunity for us as broadcasters. Um, but what we're going to see is we're going to see more of apps be more important, streaming um, of, of newscast. Um, uh, really, it's, you know, and kind of the way that we approach it is, is it's, it's, we are our own network now. You know, we don't necessarily need NBC to, you know, to broadcast anymore. We can do this on, you know, we can do this over the internet. Um, you know, we can do it over apps. People can take it, you know, on their cell phones. This has really changed the game of a lot of what we do here. And, uh, um, and so I, I think we're going to see a lot more media consolidation. You talked about the, the Denver Post, um, you know, being bought. Um, I don't know if anyone's, you know, out there has paid attention to, um, you know, what's been in the news as far as Sinclair and Sinclair Broadcast Group. They're the largest broadcast ownership group in the United States. 100 and, 160 stations, I believe. Um, if the Tribune deal goes through, which it looks like it's going to, they're, they're buying Tribune, which means they will now have WGN, um, which now they have a network, a, a complete national network. And, 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 you know, their goal, David Smith, the gentleman who, who owns Sinclair Broadcast, um, you know, he's a, he, he wants to create a network to compete with Fox News on, you know, on the right. Um, and so, so I think we're going to see a whole lot more consolidation. Um, it, it's, it's really hard uh, when you're talking about negotiating retrans dollars with the, with the network. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's really hard for the smaller guys. Um, you know, our company, uh, KOAA, is owned by Cordillera Communications. We've got 12 stations. Um, you know, most of them are in, you know, our biggest markets are Colorado Springs, Tucson, and Lexington, Lexington Kentucky. The rest of our stations are, you know, smaller markets like Montana. And it's really hard for us to negotiate um, – you know, to negotiate those retrans dollars. And so that really hurts a company like ours. So that's what you, why you're seeing the Sinclair's gobble up folks, the next stars gobble up, you know, gobble up folks. And, and so we're going to see a lot more consolidation, but we're also going to see more ways for companies like Portalera, who owns us, to be able to get our message out there via apps, via OTT, things of that nature. So that, that's where I see it. That's where I see it going. And I think it's a great thing. You know, it gives us a chance, um, you know, I've got an executive producer of digital content here and he oversees all of our digital staff. And, um, and, you know, he and I had a meeting today that, okay, we're doing a great job as far as getting, you know, as far as, you know, taking article and as far as getting a lot of information out there to folks. Now what I want us to do is I want us to start thinking of ways to get more in-depth information out. So I want them to start looking and, and working with my investigative team here to, to really make rich investigative articles that, that, that tell folks that how and that why, you know, that, that's, you know, because that's what matters to them. And so, and so, and, you know, how this affects their life on a daily basis and, and, and what they need to know about it. And so, um, and, and so I think we're going to see a whole lot more of that, especially from, you know, the, the Cordilleras, the Raycoms, the, you know, the, the small, and Raycoms kind of a medium sized player, but, uh, but I think we're going to see a lot more of that from, from, those smaller to medium sized groups is a lot of a, a lot of digital um, a lot of digital plays. Uh, well, thank you, Ryan, for your time and insights. And with that, uh, that will conclude our enlightening talks uh, session for tonight. A huge thanks to again, Ryan again for your time and participation. Um, thank you to all of our viewers for joining us. You can also register for upcoming enlightening talks sessions from the enlightening talks webpage at csuglobal.edu/enlightening-talks. Uh, On behalf of everyone here at Colorado State University Global Campus, thank you and goodbye.